Most likely, you've been watching movies your whole life, and I know you have your own memories of your first time watched, magical movie moments you'll never, ever forget. Beautiful scenes that shifted the flow of your synapses and opened your eyes to art and dreams and pure wonder. But on the other side of that, we've all got trauma that we'll also never, ever forget, but for absolutely the wrong reasons. It's Halloween season, and it's time to take a walk back down spooky memory lane and confront some of those kids' movies that were too damn scary and shook us to our little pre-adolescent cores. We weren't equipped to handle some of the villains in kids' movies back then, but now, hopefully, we are ready to confront those demons. I mean, yeah, some of them were in fact demons. And move on from the trauma. So, here we go. Let's check in with some of the most traumatizing so-called kids' villains we haven't gotten over yet. Remember me, Eddie? When I killed your brother! The first too scary villain is the reason we made this list at all, to be honest. Judge Doom from Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Why did I pick him? Because Disney made him a meetable character at their Oogie Boogie Bash at Disney Parks, which is ostensibly a children's event. No one could ever accuse me of being the decency police, but have you no shame, Disney? Think of the children! <laughs> If you're not familiar with the character, he's played by the normally very lovable Christopher Lloyd, but this time he's the cruel, corrupt, much-feared overlord of Toontown in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and is probably best known for painfully murdering an anthropomorphic shoe for no reason. In the movie, cartoons, or toons, coexist with humans and are treated as second-class citizens. In an effort to show strength and scare toons into respecting the law, he sets an example in front of Eddie Valiant, a curmudgeonly but ultimately good man who is helping Roger Rabbit. He grabs a squeaking, fearful little shoe against its will and brings it over to a mix of turpentine, acetone, and benzene, better known as the dip. Doom liquefies this little guy and we have to watch him shiver in fear and cry out and his eyes grow still with death before he's melted into nothing, again, may I say, for no reason. Christopher Lloyd's doom is a menacing, looming presence representing the encroachment of corruption, gentrification, and the greed of the rich upon the poor in many ways. In other ways, he's just a creep. At the film's climax, Eddie saves Roger and Jessica from the judge and the dip, but then Doom emits a confusing, high-pitched scream as his foot and eventually entire body is crushed, convulsing all the way. Except he's not crushed, he's flattened. He's the original Slender Man? No, actually, he was a toon all along, and he flails around until he finds an air tank to inflate himself into yet another new form. It's like the old one, but with huge red googly eyes that are actually daggers, and springy feet, and a high-pitched screaming voice, and a golden Inspector Gadget hand? There's too much uncanny going on, and my brain doesn't like it. And then, of course, we have to watch him melt to death, whooping all the way down into putrescent. Anyway, kids, come see Judge Doom kill the shoe again nightly, now at the Disney Resort. They say even the proudest spirit can be broken with love. For many young children, their mother is the most supportive and beloved caregiver in their entire world. That's what makes Coraline's other mother so damn terrifying. That and the fact that she's actually a shape-shifting skeletal demon in a disguise with creepy dead button eyes who lures children in before eating their souls and bones. She said that she loved us, but she loved us here and ate up our lives. The other mother, or the Bedlam, appears in 2002's Coraline book, but her appearance in the stop-motion 2009 Coraline movie is what really seals the deal, with its unsettling visuals and performance by Terry Hatcher. She beckons fun, normal activities like playing hide-and-seek in the rain, never eating, suddenly having a living room made of bugs, kidnapping parents, and making kids sew buttons into their eyes. The cherry on top of this abduction skeleton nightmare monstrosity 
is body horror. I think what's really scary about this is you could easily see a kid falling for the other mother's tricks. That and the weird neck unfolding transformation when she undoes her disguise and just how damn creepy and sinister everything is right under the surface. People don't like buttons for eyes. I don't care how good your chandelier smoothies are. <laughs> Come here, chicken! You probably think The Wizard of Oz is a nice fantasy story with a teenage Dorothy, Toto, and her quite humanoid, harmless friends searching for the wizard and escaping a stereotypically evil witch with the help of a beautiful nice witch, featuring bright and vivid visuals, iconic songs, and a timeless charm. And it is! 1939's The Wizard of Oz is all of those things. It's perhaps the textbook definition of a classic. 1985's Return to Oz is not these things. Granted, I didn't see this movie until high school when my friend said, Hey, do you want to see a f***ed up 80s movie? But if I had seen this as a little child, I would have cried because it was a f***ed up 80s movie. If you're unaware of the plot, Dorothy is back home after the events of The Wizard of Oz and is much younger because she was in the original book series. Her aunt and uncle do not think she had a cute dream about Oz. They think she needs a trip to an insane asylum and some shock therapy. All of this is very outdated on top of being dark, I know. She escapes the asylum during a thunderstorm and eventually wakes up back in Oz, which is now a disaster and everyone in Emerald City has been turned to stone by the Gnome King and Dorothy's only allies to fix this are a talking chicken, a clockwork robot man, and a tree with a pumpkin for a head. All but the chicken are pretty difficult to look at. Here I am. The whole thing is scary and qualifies as a horror movie. There are so many terrifying components in this movie. The rock guards, the little girl getting strapped to a freaking quack machine that's going to electroshock her brain, all the claymation in general, how the Gnome King dies, this awful castle filled with decapitated women's heads, the attitudes toward women in general. It's all a horror show. But I think the part that's going to make this list has got to be the Wheelers. Their design is so ghoulish and chilling and dare I say unique and singularly awful? Did H.R. Giger secretly work on Return to Oz? The faces, both normal and the ones on the helmets? Terrifying. The squeaking? <laughs> Unsettling. The way their limbs sit and unnaturally move, sickening. They cackle, jeer, scream, and shoot out at speeds that are just way too fast, and oh yeah, threaten to tear a little girl to pieces for the crime of knowing a chicken. This movie is a far cry from its much more famous predecessor, and if you were expecting a charming sequel in the same vein, well, you are in for a pretty bad surprise. Like Dorothy, at almost every turn. <laughs> Are a pretty prize. And while we're on the topic of terrifying villains from 80s movies for children, we can't leave out Tarek from Ewoks Battle for Endor, one of the first live action entries in Star Wars Legends slash Expanded Universe. Battle for Endor, of course, is the sequel to Caravan of Courage, an Ewok adventure, which was also a children's movie featuring a pretty scary villain, the Gorax, a gross monster who kidnaps the main character's parents in that movie. Anyway, Battle for Endor introduces us to Tarek, the evil leader of a group of deadly marauders who are all about raiding Ewok villages and giving them the business alongside his main, uh, I don't know, business partner? She's a witch by the name of Sharl, and look, they just both suck. Not super creepy by modern day movie makeup standards, but look, when we were all little kids, this looked creepy as shit. Make no mistake. But the real reason Tarek belongs on this list? Because Bro straight up kills the parents and the brother of the little girl Sindel. They all had just survived the first movie, only for this motherfucker to roll up and delete Sindel's whole family. I want the power. Here's why this is kind of chilling to a little kid who was just starting to understand the weight of shared movie universes. The Empire had just fallen, the Tawanis had crash landed on Endor and befriended the Ewoks in Caravan of Courage, and then fought like hell to defend the village once Tarek and his boys pulled up. Surely good always triumphs over evil, doesn't it? 
No! It turns out, the Tawanis died all the same. Learning that truth as a little kid isn't fun. Not only did Tarek look pretty creepy, he hung out with a witch that had a weird little moat monster that would just shred anything that went in the water. All pretty scary to a little kid. Uh. Also scary? Diabetes. Yes, that is Wilford Brimley. He's in this movie and basically winds up Cindy's adopted papa at the end because Tarek sucked. Oh, I'm really getting the hang of this. <laughs> I do believe we are destined to be soul mates. Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest is an environmentally conscious, independent, animated musical about fairies, humans, and the folly of pollution. It ran against Disney Animation in their golden era and did a pretty admirable job despite that. Fern Gully features A-plus voice acting from both Robin Williams as a bat who suffered from animal testing and Tim Curry as the villain I'm about to talk about in a film that is somehow one of the most 90s things I've ever seen. Humans free a dark spirit named Hexus from from a scary as hell tree in the process of deforestation, and thus this gloopy symbiote looking goo thing fortifies itself with various forms of man made pollution and becomes more and more powerful, eventually killing the matriarch fairy and a lot of the rainforest. Did I mention it's the last one? Primary oh. testing laboratory. No! Pass the probe. <coughs> Graduate students all gather for. No! Love the haircut. <laughs> Hexus transforms into air pollution, and then his final form, a giant black skeleton with fire inside it and a toxic oil sludge cape? A plus nightmare fuel, 10 out of 10. Thanks, I hate it. Since this is a kid's movie, the forces of good win through a heroic sacrifice and what I would call a Poison Ivy signature move. However, Hexus could come back if people become greedy and pollute, and spoiler alert, humans love doing that. Yes, my soldiers. Soon the Black Cauldron will be mine. Some people say, oh, Disney should remake the Black Cauldron instead of the Lion King and Aladdin, and I don't agree. I had every opportunity to put this particular movie in a feature about why Disney should give the live-action remake treatment to some of its cult animated hits instead of its certified hits, and I didn't. Why? Well, the protagonist characters are very one-dimensional, if not absolutely grating, Gurgi, but the Horned King and the Army of the Dead are too scary. I really don't want to give this guy the power of modern computer-generated imagery. Just look how far they got with 1985 technology. Welcome, your majesty. <laughs> We're just celebrating our success. The themes and sets are all pretty dark and gloomy and intensely treacherous. I think it's the stark contrast between very simple childlike characters like Terran, Ilanwi, Hedwin the Pig, and that damn stupid Gurgi, and the often grotesque animation of the Horned King and his Risen from the Dead skeleton army. The visuals were stunning for the time with very new CGI additions, but also too scary in juxtaposition to the lighter themes that seem to be made to appeal to children specifically. What's up with that magic realistic? melted fire skull thing. Does the Horned King have to look like a humongous dirty old skeleton with messed up sharp teeth and claws yet speak with a crisp, focused villain voice? Now, Pig Keeper, you shall die. What's up with these frames of suffering melting men? And even though the Horned King does ultimately die, did it have to look like that? With all the sinew and flesh rot peeling? Ugh. Oh no. Oh, horrible! While this was not a successful movie for Disney, The Black Cauldron is said to have inspired Shigeru Miyamoto while creating The Legend of Zelda and actually had an also too scary animatronic in Tokyo Disneyland. So hey, at least it worked for someone. And credit where it's due, these visuals were way ahead of the movie's time. Too far ahead. I wonder how long it's gonna take him to push through. The suspense is terrible. He, he's gonna go this time. I hope it'll last. Willy Wonka. I, I don't need to say much more. Are the fires of hell a glowing? Is the grizzly reaper mowing? Yes! The danger must be growing for the rowers keep on rowing! If you told me Willy Wonka isn't a villain, then you would be wrong. Wrong! You lose! Good day, sir! 
Willy Wonka is an unhinged control freak whose wild swings from blankness to full blast, popped vein, wild-eyed shouting are impeccably portrayed by Gene Wilder. From the moment he enters, he practically begs you not to trust him. He happily lets children get badly hurt, if not deformed. He definitely has slaves, and he really doesn't seem to care about the damage he causes as long as his needs are met. And they do get met because he's a rich and powerful maniac. He's off-putting to children because he should be off-putting to children. He's a very dangerous person and a good example of why you shouldn't trust strangers with candy. And I never want to see another story about how he got that way again! Thanks for watching, and for more spooky stuff, here are the 10 greatest horror movies of all time as voted by the IGN staff, so check that out, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.